Hi, and welcome to Investment Analysis with Professor Nugent. This is Chapter 1, Understanding Investments, and this is part of the FIN 539 course. So learning objectives for this is to under, I want you to understand investments as a field, um, how it's practiced in possible jobs opportunities, and uh, help you to understand investment decisions that are going to help enhance your overall wealth over your lifetime and also create some um, realistic expectations of the, the uh, wealth generation ability of investments in cap through capital gains and dividends and things of that nature. Uh, the one thing to really understand is that investments are a game for patient people. If you're impatient, you know, the money is going to run away from you. But if you're very patient and you're very systematic in your approach to investing, you can do very well. But it, takes, it can take many years. I myself um, was interested in investing at a very young age, actually in high school, and I read some books. One of the best books was Peter Lynch, One Up on Wall Street. It was a really fascinating book that I do recommend it. It, said it was always a bestseller, and, and it, this is, Peter Lynch is the, the most successful mutual fund manager of all time. And he had um, a very simplistic way of thinking about stocks and investing in stocks. And, and he would basically say, you know, Investigate companies you're familiar with and, and you know are doing well because they're a potentially good source for investment. And you want to, and the title of the book, One Up on Wall Street, means you can get there before the Wall Street people do. And if you do, you get much bigger returns than if you just follow the Wall Street people after they've invested. So, part of this course, I'm going to use some of that philosophy. But for you know, the first five to eight years of my investing, and luckily at the time I didn't have a lot of money, I was just starting out in my career. Uh, I did poorly. I lost money uh, almost five out of eight years. Uh, I lost money and didn't do well. And it, it took me about eight years, made a lot of mistakes to really learn patience, to learn what works, learn in investing in a research style, analysis, and um, reading a lot of books and magazines and just making a lot of mistakes and learning from them. And eventually, I got to a point where I guess I made all the mistakes and I started making money and I started doing well in investments. And it's, you know, for me, investing and understanding investments is a lifelong pursuit because things change, markets change, investment styles and approaches change, valuation changes. So you really need to um, do a lot of self-study uh, after this, during and after this course to really keep up with the investment world. And it's, it's just sort of a um, field that you have to always keep on top of because, you know, <clears throat> it changes rather quickly. Now, investments as defined is a pretty, I mean, I think everybody understands this. You know, you take some funds, money, and you put it into some sort of asset. That could be artwork, a house, stocks, bonds, uh, gold. And you hope that these assets at a certain point will accumulate and be worth more. You know, so you're holding assets. <clears throat> that are going to be more valuable in the future. And that's how you get a decent return. So initially, you may ask, why should I take this course? Why should I study investments? Well, because you need a logical framework for managing your money and investments. <clears throat> you need a systematic approach uh, to how you're going to invest your money and how you're gonna increase wealth. You can't just wing it. You really wanna be well-versed in what's available, how to, what investment vehicles there are. And in addition, a good reason for taking this course is potentially a career in the field. You may wanna work in the field. So in this class, I'm gonna give you some skills that can help you with um, security, security analyst. So it's basically analyzing stocks. So securities are stocks and bonds, and the analyst is someone who sits there and analyzes and values them and thinks about them and does a bunch of research. And that's a really rewarding a career. Is also a portfolio manager, which is someone usually you start out as a securities analyst, and if you're really good at it, you may be able to be promoted to a portfolio manager where you manage like a mutual fund or groups of assets. Um, there's also a some sort of uh, registered representative, a stockbroker, financial um, 
advisor, things of that nature, plenty of jobs in, in that field where you're providing advice to people for their investments, planning their retirements, helping them with stocks and, and things of that nature. Um, some of those certified financial planner, chartered financial analysts, these are some of the types of uh, registered representatives you could be. And I guess the two real career paths, you sometimes say the buy side, sell side, um, but here we're talking about analysts and management. So you're either analyzing stocks or you're managing money. So, um, you know, two different distinct uh, positions, but there, there are a lot of careers tied into and wrapped around the investment world, especially here in, uh, especially in New York. So, um, also, just to go back for a second, if you're taking this course and you really like investments, uh, two other courses to take would be advanced investments and portfolio management, or one or the other. Um, and they will be offered, uh, uh, those two courses we offer definitely within the next year. So look for those. And there, if you like this course, those are a good addition to the course and a follow up. Now, something very important for anybody interested, seriously interested in finance and their education is the idea of the CFA, Chartered Financial Analyst. There's a website right here on the slide that would be a really good website for you to go to check, go and check out because this group, this is really, this test is equal or greater than the CPA. So you know how you take, you want to be an accountant and you take the CPA and suddenly you're very um, hireable and marketable security. So if you have a CPA, you know, that's like a $100,000 job is waiting for you after you get your, your CPA. It's the same thing with CFA. That really the difference is if you just graduate with an accounting degree or a finance degree, you might be able to find a $50,000 job, maybe, maybe even a $60,000 job possibly. But if you graduate and you have passed the CPA, now you're going to probably move into more, closer to the $100,000 range. And if you are a financial person and you graduate and you pass a level one, maybe even level two of the CFA, level three requires some work experience. Also, the, the, C, the CPA requires some work experience to audit experience. But once you put those experience in and you pass those parts of the test, either the CPA or the CFA, then you're instantly recognized as somebody who is really on top of the field. So the CFA is the most respected and recognized investment credential. It is the CPA of the financial world. And, and CPA, some, some people have both a CPA and CFA. Those people generally say the CFA is harder uh, and more difficult and the pass rate is less on the CFA. So it is a really top notch credential to have that could really jumpstart your career. Now, um, to, uh, to really to finish and earn the CFA charter, there's three different tests. The first test you can take while you're in school or right after you graduate school, and it's the first test is, you know, it's a lot of finance, math, economics uh, in that first test, stuff that you would have taken in school. So the first test isn't too bad. Most people can pass that with a decent amount of study. Uh, but you must have four years of qualified work experience to, to pass two and three. So and it, it's, it's not too, it's a little bit more, uh, I think the requirement for work experience is more for the CFA than the CPA, but it's because it is a really um, distinguished credential to have. And I do recommend anybody who's, you know, graduating um, with, a, with a finance degree to seriously look into this and, and at least go for, you know, level one. It, I mean, having just passed a level one on your resume um, shows you're serious about the field and really can give you a leg up in getting hired. So it is, you know, the global gold standard. It is internationally known. There's almost 100,000 uh, CFA charter holders um, that work in over 135 different countries. It's just really um, the pinnacle of what you want to do in finance. Okay, so back to Peter Lynch that I was talking about earlier and you want to invest in what you know. So, and this is good too for uh, the, the stock trading simulation that we're running. So you, want to, so you want to start out, you don't know what companies to buy, you don't know what to invest in. You want to start out where companies that you're familiar with, 
It can be computer companies, if you know about computers, internet companies, um, just any type of company. And I've, I've done very well just looking at students in my class, and I'd see that they're wearing Under Armour. And I said, okay, a lot of students are now wearing Under Armour gear. What is this company? Is it something to invest in? And that turned me on to Under Armour in a very early uh, time frame, and the stock has gone up eightfold since. Uh, also back, this is, you know, a good 10 years ago, I, I, I started noticing students getting these graduation gifts, and they were iPod, iPods. And I didn't, what, what's an iPod? I, and the students were explaining to me, oh, you put all your music on it. And I'm like, what, you know, like, is it like an um, MP3 player? I can put 25 songs on it? And like, no, you can put 1,000 songs on this. And it comes with, in his iTunes. And so I was like, wow, this is really great. And that's when I thought, you know, Apple would be, this is really going to be a hit product for them. And this would be a good time to invest in Apple. Now, this is, I invested in Apple early, and I did make a decent amount of money, but I sold out way too early. If I would have held it today, it would have been a, you know, a phenomenal return. But I mean, I, I tripled my money and sold it and thought I did really well. But here, here's a point where if I was a little bit more patient and gave the stock a little bit more time, I would have done even better. Um, so these are just examples of, you look at everyday life, what products are starting to become popular? What stores in the mall are, start, are starting to be really popular where you know people are going there to buy clothes and you know what is um what companies what products uh, uh are just really you know doing well i mean you have to look around and wake up and look at everything as a business opportunity so a lot of times you'll find a company or an idea but it won't be publicly traded yet so you'll say oh okay i'll have to wait uh but hopefully you could find something that is publicly traded that the best situation is it's become publicly traded and then their their really hit product or software or website or idea comes out later and you discover it and you really recognize how valuable it is before most people do and then you get into the stock before it really takes off so that's where this whole idea of you want to um get to it before wall street does and that's why you want to think about looking up the one up on wall street book by peter lynch it could, it's definitely worth a read Okay, so I mean, investment decisions, if you think about investment decisions, um, they're, they could be sort of um, scary. And the basic thing that you're trying to do is a trade-off between risk and return. So risk is the possibility of not getting your money back or not getting the return you expected or losing money. And, you know, so the idea is if something's more risky, you would want to get paid more. So delivering pizza on any ordinary night is, is one thing, but delivering it tonight, if there's a, you know, if it's snowing outside and, and it's, it's really dangerous, you would expect hopefully to get at least bigger tips or more pay incentive to do that. So, you know, that's just, you know, think of also, um, jumping over a pit that's only four feet across most people can easily jump four feet and you know if i said i give you ten dollars to jump over something four feet across most people would do it now if it was 10 feet across um and at the bottom of it is molten lava and you're going to die if you fall and don't make it you're not going to do that for ten dollars because the risk is too great but if i offered you a million many people might just do that so Risk is really something that is hard to always know exactly what the risks involved in certain investments. And that's where analysts come in, and investment analysts come in handy is that they could better quantify the risks so that way you know that um, what's at stake. Now, the other side of it is quantifying the returns. So if you could figure out you would ideally would want an investment with low risk and high returns. And that's what we're all trying to do as an investment analysts is, is really discover that. Uh, you know, and, and the stock markets have a rough time. We've had really sharp declines in 2000 and 2002. And again, from you know, 2008 to 2009, where you know, in the 2008 to 2009, the stock market went down 50%. I was talking to people who had, you know, they might have had $400,000 in their retirement account, and suddenly now they have 200,000 a year later. It's, and they got scared and they sold their all out of all their stocks. Well, if they would have just held on to that 
200,000 in stocks and didn't sell, it would have been now been over two, over 400,000 if they waited to um, 2015, you know, they would get all that money back and, and probably would be 500,000 because the stock market's returned even more than, the, than where it was in 2008. You know, um, so it's an important thing to um, not to get scared and capitulate and sell your stocks. If you're going to be invested in stocks as in a retirement vehicle, you want to hold steady with that, even during bumpy periods where it might be scarier. Just kind of say to yourself, okay, you're not going to sell out. Maybe you're, you want to buy. When everybody else is screaming and selling and running for the doors, maybe it's a good time for you to buy. I know that I've always had that philosophy and I've always done well buying on the downturns and, and maybe not investing as heavily on the, on the, on the strong upswings, you know. Okay. Now, most investors, though, are risk adverse. So like I was saying before, you want to you wanna get more return as risk increases. And what you have to understand as, your, as an investor yourself, you have to understand what is your risk tolerance? How much risk can you take? It's sort of like you know, going to the casino. Do you want to be at the $5 table making your bets? Or do you want to be in the $25, $50, or $100 table? So every bet is $100. Now, if you can't tolerate a high risk like that, because you could lose $100 with just one turn of a card, you should sit at the $5 table, and you'll enjoy yourself more, and you won't be as nervous or worried or upset. So a lot of times you have to really decide on what your risk tolerance is, how much risk you're willing to assume um, in your investments. Now, here's a little chart. You know, basically, if you look here, um, treasury bonds are considered risk-free, like a 10-year treasury bond or bill is a risk-free, and you're not going to really lose any money, and you'll make a few percentage points. Bonds are a little bit more riskier, and you'll get a higher return. And stocks, of course, are the riskiest, but they have the biggest expected return. You know, and this is, this is pretty common knowledge here. Okay, so uh, let's talk about retirement for a second. Now, you should be focused on retirement. And there's a couple things, a pathway to retirement that I'm going to talk about more in class, but it's not as hard as most people think. The problem is everybody used to have pensions, and they just took care of themselves, and they were professionally managed, and they did very well, and, but they were expensive. So companies got rid of their pensions and put everybody in a 401k, which means you have to manage the money yourself. And most people don't, don't have a finance-level college education where they know how to manage their money. So a lot of people screwed up in, in their 401k accounts, and they didn't save enough or invest properly, and now they're really way, well behind on their retirement savings. So one of the things I want to focus in this class is just some helpful advice in this area. So the first advice I'd give you is before you get your job, you could still save your you know, professional job. You, you have this IRA that's available to you, which after you make over $50,000, I think it, they kind of close it off. So in your initial in, investing, start with an IRA and, and put some money into an IRA. And um, it also helps reduce your taxes. And then you can invest that money. You know, you get a broker. Uh, we'll be talking about brokers more in future chapters. And you, you open up an IRA and you put some money in, into as much as you can afford. And then eventually when you get your, your full-time job, your professional job, they'll have a 401k. Now, don't think that, okay, I'm young. I don't need to start my 401k yet. Or I, wanna, I have bills and student loans to pay. I don't want to start contributing to the 401k yet. Biggest mistake. As soon as you get that job, enroll in the 401k, put... Put, they generally match a certain amount. Maybe they'll match 50% of the first 5% or, or 100% of 4% of your you know, salary. So if that's the case, always contribute the maximum amount you can that they're going to match. And the great thing about the 401k is all, it's tax-free. So if you invest $100 a paycheck, you think your paycheck's going to go down $100. It doesn't. It may only go down $60 because... Out of the hundred dollars you're investing, forty of it would normally have gone to the government. So that's why the 401k is really great because you're not paying the taxes on that money you normally would have. So a, 
a $60 investment turns into a $100 investment because of this tax savings. So you want to start that 401k as early as possible, and you want to try to put as much money in that as possible. Because the more money you put in early on, the bigger uh, compounding effect it has later. So if you, I set a goal for the first year is five to 10,000 in your 401k. And as soon as you can, you want to ramp that up to the maximum amount, which is right now 18,000 that you can put into a 401k. If you can do that, that would be really help jumpstart your retirement. And then eventually what happens, you do this from your twenties into your thirties and maybe into your early forties. And then you start to realize, Hey, I have so much money in here now, I could retire early. I could retire at 55, not 65 or 70 like most people. And they're working longer these days because they haven't, you say, properly for retirement. So this is why you want to aggressively save for your 401k. Now, savings is critical too. I mean, you want to have savings outside your 401k because once the money's in the 401k, you really can't touch it for a long period of time without penalties. So you want to also have a savings account that hopefully has three to six months worth of living expenses in it. Um, Social Security is something that you may or may not may not be available by the time you retire, uh, or they may change the age that you can receive it. They may move it up to 75 or 70 as the age you can receive it to try and um, make the, the Social Security system a little bit more stable. So you can't really rely on that too well. Pensions are pretty much all but done, so you're most likely not going to see a pension. And a good question is, how much money will you need when you retire? And, you know, we can do some time value money formula formulations uh, later on in the class to, and talk about that some more, but I'm moving on at this point. So let's talk about the investment process. Um, so the investment process is... What this book will kind of, or this lecture will talk about a two-step process. The first one, uh, really basic, securities analysis and valuation. And that's what this class is going to focus on. Um, understanding security characteristics and understanding a methodology that helps you analyze stocks and, and find a valuation. So you want to say, okay, Google is really worth $600 a share, is currently trading at $550 a share. So there's some room to buy it, there's some room to move up on it. And that's basically what the valuation is. You're really just trying to put a true value on something uh, and see if it's worth the current price. That's why, you know, if you're shopping for a house, you may see a house and say, okay, this is what similar houses in the neighborhood sold. This is the features of the house. I think the house is worth 300000 and but they're selling it for 225000 Definitely a buy. That's the basic principle. You're just trying to value it. Uh, using metrics and indicators and, and as much research as you can to get an idea of what it's really worth. And if you can get the valuation correct and be there before most people or realize something, something's value before that most people don't realize, then, then you're ahead of the game. Now, portfolio management is something that would be talked about more in the advanced investment class or the portfolio management class. And the, and the portfolio management is really putting a portfolio together of investments in a, in a logical way to make it efficient uh, for your whatever your investing needs are um, and how to measure a portfolio and how to analyze the risk of a portfolio. So that's more a collection of stocks. We'll talk about that somewhat in this, in this class, but it's focused on more heavily in the advanced investment classes. Okay, so some factors in the process. Um, thinking about, you know, the, the, it's the future, it's really the future returns and the future cash flows of the company that are most important, that are difficult to be, to be accurately estimated. So looking at the past returns of the company and looking at the past performance is not necessarily a 100% accurate predictor of future performance, as any mutual fund will tell you, past performance is not an accurate predictor of future performance. But it's, if you're looking at companies, it certainly helps to see how they did in the past. Um, now, there is, you shouldn't be invested totally in stocks and bonds within the United States. There's plenty of opportunities outside of the United States. Um, and there, you know, the investment world and the risks and the world economies change quickly. So there is a need to 
um, realize how the environment is changing and possibly take advantage of that in your portfolios and your investing. And I mean, the internet has opened up a huge host of opportunities, not just companies to invest in, but tools and research to utilize um, for your investment needs. So all these things can affect the process of investing. Okay. Now, just some other things to talk about. The, you know, the, in the global perspective, the United States is a significant portion of the world's stock valuation. At one point, it was as high as 60% of the world's total valuation was just U.S. companies. Now it's falling a little bit, somewhere between 40 and 50%. But internationally, there's a lot of opportunities in Europe, in Asia, in the Middle East, uh, even in you know, uh, developing countries in all over the world. They're really developing countries are in every continent. There are a lot of opportunities for growth. Uh, many U.S. companies are taking advantage of international opportunities, and a lot of international companies are doing well, even moving into the U.S. market to sell their goods and services and exports. So even if you buy a company that's domestic, they probably have a significant amount of impact from their, their sales and profits internationally. Um, so as you know, advice to many U.S. investors, you, know, you need to diversify your portfolios and invest more globally. And I think a key thing is to, to have investments in China and um, Asia, which is usually the most underrepresented. A lot of um, investors will have significant investments in the U.S. and Europe, but they really just need to recognize some of the up-and-coming countries and, and opportunities around the world. Um, you know, currency is a big issue, too. As the dollar strengthens, it actually makes uh, purchasing stocks in other countries more affordable. So if the dollar strengthens and, say, the Canadian dollar weakens, now you're, you can buy Canadian stocks at a 20% discount from a year ago. So currency is another big factor in trading stocks abroad or internationally, especially the currency exchange. Now, something else to think about, um, when we think about the internet, this has really leveled the playing field. Because it used to be, I remember that, I used to have to go to the library and look up com company information and quarterly books that were published by S&P. So it was really delayed information, not very valuable, and then I would have to call up on the phone to make my stock trades. You know, and this was, I was really young at the time. But when the internet came out, now I could suddenly get information so quickly and so evenly and so much research was available that today there's more than I could ever, I can only even get to a fraction of 1% of the information that's out there. Uh, and the government, U.S. government, uh, SEC put out Regulation FD, which regulates communications between the public's public companies and investment professionals. And what used to happen was the companies used to tell analysts, stock analysts, what, you know, their idea of what's going to happen or important information. And then people would pay their stockbrokers who would have access to these analysts to get this information. So it was really an unfair type of um, process going on. And then the Regulation FD, which is, stands for Fair Disclosure, now when a company releases information, they can't release it only to analysts. They have to release it to everybody simultaneously. So the Internet's a great way to look at news releases and see, you know, what's available. And it makes, the Internet makes investing a lot more fair and information flow a lot more freely. Uh, and you have really two types of investors. You have the individual investor, which is the people like you and me who just invest for ourselves and for our retirement and for our wealth generation. Uh, and these people, uh, some, a lot of these people look to advice from stockbrokers and financial analysts for help. And there's a lot of jobs in the area. But there's also institutional investors. And, and these are, uh, and I did some work in this area for corporations, helping corporations to look at investments and in value companies uh, to acquire and, or, or even stocks and bonds to invest in. So, and an institutional investor, though, is primarily somebody who is researching and portfolio constructing for other for clients. So an institutional investor is someone who is um, is, I guess, on one hand, you know, in, individuals are indirect beneficiaries of institutional act actions. Um, 
so the institutional actions like mutual fund companies, insurance companies, big companies, they are going to make large purchases of stocks, and they'll be they're more institutionalized in how they trade and purchase and stocks, where they're using you know professional individuals with educations and experience who are going to make these trades on the institutional side. And generally, the institutional investors, they do better than the individual investors because they have the skills, the training, uh, the experience. But that's not to say that you as an individual investor don't have the opportunity to do just as well as the institutional investors uh, because a lot of the tools these institutional investors use is now available through the Internet um, and through various websites and charting websites and uh, Hoover's websites with financials and databases of balance sheets and income statements that we're going to talk about work with in this company in this in this course to help um, everyone do better now um, a big area of investing that needs to be talked about is ethics in investing the the problem is in the past certain investments um, certain individuals weren't very ethical and they created financial crisis like the the financial crisis in 2008 was cr created by people putting together mortgages and repackaging and selling them securities, billing them as very safe securities to other investors when they really weren't. It was, un it was unethical the way they lent money to people who really didn't qualify or really were very risky to, to lend money to, to, to mortgage a house. And then repackage this garbage loans and sell it to investors as really safe, uh, reliable uh, sources of investment. So that was very un unethical. To, to do that and cause a huge financial crisis and this was a, a lot of people were involved in these in these decisions from mortgage brokers to banks to Fannie Mae Freddie Mac and you know it just goes throughout the whole industry and it was really so the greed had just really taken over and people really weren't questioning the ethical actions of who they were making these loan these loans to and who's responsible if people if they default they passed it all down to the individual investor so they're the ones who paid the most for this now, as you know, if you think about before that 2008 crisis, there was a crisis in uh, 2000, around 2002, 2003, uh, after the internet bubble burst and the, the markets went down, we discovered that companies like Enron, WorldCom, uh, HealthSouth, they were falsifying their financial statements and in, in, in fraud um, that Investors had no idea. Investors lost millions because these companies were falsifying the value of the companies to keep trying to push the stock higher and higher. And I worked for a short time at Symbol Technologies. Uh, that's not around anymore. It was acquired by Motorola. But Symbol Technologies at the time, I got hired from them. And I was working in their, in their finance department. And I discovered a lot of this fraudulent behavior. And I, and I was I didn't know at the time it was fraudulent, but I was saying to my boss like this is not the right way of doing it. The revenue recognition is incorrect. The inventory valuation, the, you know, uh, and, and he he got really you know angry with me and almost violent. So I only lasted there less than a month, and I just said I'm not going to be putting my name on any of this stuff. I'm not going to be involved because you guys are doing it wrong. And I just thought they were doing it wrong. They didn't know any better, and they didn't want to listen to me. So I left and went somewhere else. Three months later, my boss is arrested and taken out of the company in handcuffs. And I would think to myself, thank God I just stood up for myself and left that job and didn't give in to the pressure to produce falsified, you know, misleading um, uh, financial reports, which I would never do. And, and I mean, I lost a really good job over it. And it was really embarrassing for me to take this big job and then have to explain to people a month later that I quit. Um, but I wouldn't stand for that unethical behavior. I just it just was not something I would be a part of. And it wound up that. You know, four of the six people I was working with in that department were all arrested for it, and they and the stock crashed, and it was really horrible. And then, you know, a big area of ethics is also um, when we talk about insider trading. And there are plenty. If you see that movie, um, The Wolf of Wall Street, um, and there's a few movies like this um, where, in some cases, people get inside information. And they may get it from a relative or, or, or someone who's on the board or someone who's in the company that knows that something's going to happen, something big's going to happen, and they let you know about it. And if you trade on that, that's not fair to everybody else. You can't be trading on stock based on information that's not fully disclosed. So 
if you're an employee of a company, you have to be very careful what you tell other people. You might accidentally give inside information out. And the SEC it takes it very serious. And if you do um, any type of inside information and trade stock based on this, um, this information that's not publicly known, you're breaking the law. So, uh, of course, you know, sometimes it's hard to understand what is, is this inside information or not? And should I tell somebody? And in the past, people have come to me and they've given me information and I've never traded on it. But it's been funny how how I thought the stock would react is not always how the stock does react. So sometimes it's even tricky to get the inside information right. Um, okay, so that, I mean, this first chapter is rather short. Uh, we're going to move into next time, we're going to move into chapter two when we talk about uh, different investment uh, opportunities, how uh, money markets work and capital markets, uh, bond characteristics, treasury bonds, municipal securities, mortgage-backed securities, convertible bonds, asset-backed securities, types of stocks, dividends. So we're going to cover a lot of the basic terminology and verbiage that is used in investments to give you a better idea so we move forward to the other chapters when I talk about these different financial um, terminologies and, and vehicles, you have a good idea of what they are and we can move forward from there. Okay, so I look forward to seeing you next time and uh, take care.